I wouldn't read a huge amount into this report in terms of giving the all clear. When you look at the data right now, what we have to realize is that they are backward looking. Even away from the banking stresses, we think now would be a very good time to pause and reassess. I think they're going to go ahead and hike at the May meeting as well and then take their pause. And I think you have recession coming later this year. We're still a long way from 2% at this point. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, live from the IMF Spring Meetings in Washington, D.C., with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from the nation's capital for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and on radio. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow from IMF global headquarters from Washington, D.C. The conversation will continue through the next several hours here in D.C. TK, we've got a lot to talk about. We need to talk about the gloom that's been taking place behind us over the last couple of days and the fact that the gloom hasn't been captured by U.S. officials, either by the Treasury Secretary or by the Fed officials we've heard repeatedly from over the last couple of days. I totally agree, and it's a change Thursday because we got through 8.30 yesterday. We move on from the fixation of the inflation report, what we saw in the markets there. We can get to that. But it's much more a focus this morning within the zeitgeist about debt, about China, and the shockingly cautious view the IMF has on the view five years forward. Also need to talk about the economic data as well. Retail sales coming up tomorrow morning. A little bit later, U.S. jobless claims. Lisa, you'll run through the times of all of that. U.S. jobless claims last week just starting to break out, just a little bit. I think we've all forgotten. Payrolls was decent, but everything before payrolls, not so good. Jobless claims today have more importance than they have had for quite a while. And I would argue that not only did last week we see a tick upward, but we also saw a revision upward in the prior week. This was important. It was a material shift, and it changes the tone of perhaps we are seeing that softening that so many people have waiting. A little bit awkward at the moment, I have to say, in Washington, D.C., within the bit. Federal Reserve, because you've got the Federal Reserve staff suggesting there's a recession coming on the one hand and they've got fed officials yeah. who won't acknowledge the fact that that mild recession might be caused by the tightening they're set to engineer and still set to hike again. Yeah, I'm glad you bring this up. Craig Torres of Bloomberg has had a few years of experience writing notes. He was back when Arthur Burns was chairman. Craig Torres was reporting and he's adamant there's this divide between the PhDs. We don't hear from them and people like the presidents that Mike McKee talks about all the time, there's a real division within the Fed. Well, honestly, look, yesterday we got the meeting minutes, and it, the highlight to me was... Please, tell me. They said, I mean, this to me was fascinating. You know he hasn't read them I yet. I know that so they haven't read them, so his, let me, let me explain. Look. Okay, here, I'll give you the headline. They see a mild recession now for the later half of this year. And why? It's not because things are deteriorating more broadly and the sort of general controlled issue. It's really having to do with the banking issues that they say... Everything is fine with, and we're moving forward. Janet Yellen saying, okay, all clear. And then everyone else is coming out, and they're saying, no, we think we can actually engineer a soft landing. Soft landing is pretty much all but off the table, if you read the minutes. But that was done, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Whatever the timing is, it's ancient news in the world we're living in. That was done at the height of the financial stress. Yeah. I agree with you. I still don't think they can gauge, though, Tom, at least, and I think you would agree with this how much tightening we're set to see in credit standards off the back of the shock of the last month. And I think that makes it incredibly difficult to have any kind of forecast, never mind the five-year projections that these guys behind us have been putting out over the last couple of days. Let's talk about the next five weeks. We have no clue. And I think that that's what they keep saying, that there is some sort of material tightening but the scope of that, they just don't know with respect to the bank stress. All things being equal, had we gotten the report we got yesterday, the CPI data, any other time when we didn't see this bank stress, people would be saying, or they're going to six, they're going to six and a half percent. We would still be talking yeah. about that. And now they're done. Maybe they won't even hike because whoa, the we're, we're going to start coming. with the guest, John, this morning that really pushes against and a big that. Way. He's and waiting a big for the way, shoe to drop, and it's the American labor economy. Yeah. It hasn't dropped just yet. Not Let's yet. We're about that. We'll we'll get another today. read on claims a little bit yeah. later this morning. Lisa's going to go through the day ahead in just a moment. Here's a snapshot of the price action just <coughs> briefly in the equity market on S&P 500 futures. Just about positive by two-tenths of 1%. In the bond market, not much going on here. Lisa, yield tied by two or three basis points. The 10-year, 341.86. All right, so here's what we're watching today, 8.30 a.m. We get March producer price data, so another look at the potential uh, inflationary pressures for factories. But jobless claims, they have been boring 
and now they're not. We saw them pretty much flatlining around uh, in sub sure. 200,000. But what you can see over the past few sessions, the past few weeks, is a tick upward. How high do they go? Do people trade off this? Do we yeah. see more market reaction? That's called a hockey stick in honor of the New York Islanders defeating the Montreal Canadiens last night to make the playoffs. Thank you for getting that in. We also are at the IMF World Bank at meetings here in Washington, D.C. They do continue with Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem uh, speaking, as well as e ECB a Governing Council Member Joaquim Nagel. Do we continue to get the hawkishness from ECB members? This is really a key question. On surveillance this morning, I'm so pleased to say we also have David Malpass of the World Bank as well as IMF First Deputy Managing Director Gita Gopinath. I want to ask uh, Gita Gopinath whether she still sees the potential long rate uh, sort of projection for uh, developed market central banks going back near zero. Is that still a possibility, given the reluctance to do real damage to an economy at a time where inflation is still sticky? At 1 p.m., the U.S. is selling $18 billion of 30-year bonds. And this Thank is where God that question that can really get imbued by some sort of market sense of what they see the long run rate being of inflation. Do they sell the bonds? Do they do the auction in front of the Treasury Department? No, behind the, the Albert Gallatin no, statue? This. Oh, here they don't? Yeah, Secretary Yellen comes out behind us. In the atrium, hey. the yeah. IMF HQ, and starts taking bids for bonds. Do you guys have a bond? Sold that's Americans. That's how it works. Yeah. Every single time. That's how they I look do it. forward to that later. We'll take that live. That's not how it works. <clears throat> Dominic Constum, I love that you had to do that, yeah. just in case people thought <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that is how it works. Dominic Constant, the head of macro strategy in Mizzou Americas, joins us now. Dom, Lisa mentioned this pre-pandemic return that the IMF has talked about this week, this idea that maybe we can go back to pre-pandemic levels of neutral interest rates. Dom, do you see it that way? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, I think that, I mean, uh, there are a lot of reasons why people have argued, you know, we could be in a sort of new equilibrium, uh, maybe, you know, changing the relationship between inflation and growth uh, going forward. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no strong <coughs> evidence that that is the case. Uh, and I would argue your, your best bet is that, you know, we're going to return to some of those pre-pandemic levels. I mean, the, essentially, the Fed always has, has this view that the neutral rate is down at that sort of 2.5% level, maybe a little bit higher. Um, but that's kind of where I, I would put it, uh, all else being equal. Um, yeah, absolutely. Dominic, you've uh, coined the phrase super restrictive. I'm going to say you're out front on that. There's been so many events since we've last spoken to you. Do we continue super restrictive? And is it within the understanding of central bankers? Um, well, I think the, you know, central banks are still kind of fighting uh, the inflation sort of with a very backward looking kind of approach. You know, they're, they're sort of focused on you know, the, the latest data, which is by its nature is very backward looking. Uh, and that's because they've been a little bit obsessed about uh, inflation expectations. But inflation expectations have been very anchored. Uh, and so I would argue if you're going to basically try and sort of look forward, uh, then you are, are naturally you're going to uh, uh, basically agree that things look super restrictive with the obvious point that you've been talking about with the credit tightening that we're about to see. I mean, there, there's been no evidence uh, for a long, long time in the States that when you get uh, the tightening of credit standards coming out of these surveys, that it doesn't translate into much weaker uh, uh, loan growth. And you're already seeing that. Last couple of weeks with the weekly data, loans are basically slowing down. I and mean, they've actually dropped outright, you know, especially in the smaller banks. So, so essentially, uh, super restrictive because you've got a credit crunch coming. Uh, you add the credit crunch to what we're seeing in the labor market anyway. Uh, labor market hasn't really started to materially weaken in terms of unemployment, but it's definitely slowing down. The excess demand for labor that you've seen uh, in, for example, the JOLT survey, that's come down a lot. I'm surprised that some Fed officials kind of downplayed that. That's something we've been looking at. Uh, uh, and uh, if that continues, uh, unemployment's going to rise a lot this year at the, end, in the second half. You know, it's going to go up by much more, I think, than, than the Fed expects. And this idea of mild recession, well, good luck. If you can get a mild recession out of this, that'd be great. Uh, but uh, I think mm -hmm. that the danger is it's going to be much harder landing. Dominique, what would make you rethink your assessment right now, especially at a time when many people disagree with you, including Larry Fink yesterday, who came out of BlackRock and said he sees inflation staying around 4 percent for years? Well, I, I mean, I think one has to distinguish, uh, you know, the stickiness of inflation with what might happen to the real economy. So I think it's perfectly reasonable uh, for some people to argue that we may have to tolerate 
higher inflation uh, for longer uh, as the economy weakens uh, because of some of the drivers of inflation. I mean, we've always argued that uh, inflation is, a, is a more complicated this time around because there's some of these supply side factors uh, that are at work. I mean, one of them that kind of supports uh, inflation is that people still have a lot of money uh, in their bank from the previous fiscal stimulus. Uh, and uh, that just uh, gives them a, a little more sort of you know, momentum Wait. to inflation that wouldn't otherwise be there. Um, so the stickiness of inflation is not the same as saying, uh, you know, we can't have a slowdown in growth. And the question is, what does the Fed do in that situation? I mean, they do have a dual mandate. And one of the things is that it's easy for them to focus on inflation when unemployment's down at 3.5%. That's not going to be the case when unemployment's rising towards 5%. They, they may well have to tolerate that, that higher <clears throat> inflation. And uh, it goes well, back to the average inflation targeting thing. They'll just have to say, look, you know, inflation is going to come down. Uh, we're optimistic around that. But look, we, we've got to sort of bail out the economy. And the banking crisis, I mean, they, they may have solved the issue immediately for banks going out of business. But they haven't solved the issue for bank capital getting uh, 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 written down uh, because of bad loans that are on these books. And that's going to be an ongoing problem well, okay. uh, for the financial system. Hold on a second. Dominic, because what you're saying right now in some circles is considered incredibly avant-garde, if not perverse, because this goes against what the Fed wants us to believe, which is they're going to get back down to 2%. Are you saying it's okay for this Federal Reserve to tolerate a 4% inflation rate or maybe 3.5% inflation rate if it uh, perhaps avoids some of the deepest pain? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a question of patience. I mean, everything's transitory up to a point. Um, so, you know, I think you go back to the idea that you, you're a bit more patient around bringing inflation down if the counterpart is uh, you're going to drive unemployment up to, uh, you know, 7%. I mean, our, our projection was all else being equal, unemployment could be 7% next year. I mean, that's just, uh, that's just outrageous. Uh, and, uh, you know, to, to, to allow that to happen, uh, all because you are you know, not willing to tolerate inflation at sort of, you know, 3 to 4% for a little bit longer, I think think, uh, you know, is, would be, you know, would not be the right kind of policy, especially if there's collateral damage being done, for example, to uh, the banks, as, uh, you know, which are the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the heart of the economy to some extent over the medium term. And I think you should also recall uh, one of the issues with COVID, and there are a number of papers written about this, was one of the problems with COVID was economic scarring. Uh, the fact that uh, you, if you take out the supply side, uh, uh, you know, excessively, then you end up with a much worse inflation growth trade-off down the road. So you, you don't want to really scar the economy, uh, which will just take, uh, which will have a much longer term implications for, you know, uh, for productivity and, and, and a good inflation growth trade off. That's what I would argue. Hey, Dominic, we've got to leave it there. Thank you, sir. Dominic Costin there of Mizuho Americas. I don't know about you, Bramo, but did you hear the Fed wasn't wrong in 2021? You just weren't patient enough. Exactly. So <laughs> is anything right? is transitory if you just wait long enough, okay. like Earth. OK. Daryl Cron, the president of Wells Fargo Investment Institute, is going to join us in the next hour. Looking forward to that conversation. Some really interesting calls out there at the moment, including this one from Jordan Rochester of Nomura. Cable, pound sterling against the US dollar ton to 130. These are bold moves given the time, like what Dominic said, the huge run we have. More on that still to come from Washington, D.C. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Policymakers at the Federal Reserve are shrugging off their staff's warning of a possible recession. They're betting that they need to do a little more to curb inflation. Minutes of March's meeting indicate the central bank is on track to extend its run of interest rate hikes next month. The British economy took a bigger hit than expected from all those public sector strikes. It stalled in February, but a stronger January reading of the GDP reduces the risk of recession this year. Still, the UK is on track for an extended period of stagnation. In China, exports unexpectedly rose in March. They jumped 14.8 percent in U.S. dollar terms for a year earlier. Now, demand from Europe and most Asian countries improved. That boosts the economy's outlook and indicates global growth may be better than expected. A federal appears, appeals court will allow limited access to the abortion pill. A three-judge panel partly granted the Biden administration's request to put a hold on a Texas court ruling that overturned FDA approval of the medication. On the other hand, it also allows restrictions on abortion that were lifted since 2016. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The deferred effect of our past rate hikes 
will be more significant than the one of our future decisions. And it will then be key to stay the course for as long as necessary. To put it differently, the sprint is over, giving way to a more long distance run. The ECB is starting to sound more like the Federal Reserve. That was the Bank of France governor speaking at the Peterson Institute in Washington. Down here in Washington, D.C., good morning to you at the IMF Global Headquarters for the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings over the next couple of days. Let's check in on the price action for you as we count you down and get you ready for the opening bell. Several hours away. Equity futures positive by a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. A bit of a lift in the bond market. Yields higher by two or three basis points. Just north of 340 on a 10-year. 341. 68. I mentioned a couple of calls out there at the moment. Let's get to the call from Goldman. This is what they've got to say. Jan Hatzius and the team say this. We think the committee is now in the home stretch as we no longer forecast the hike at the June meeting. The economic data are likely to be too soft to persuade the committee. Lisa, to both deliver a hike in May and signal an upward revision to the terminal rate implied in the March dot plot. So basically the dot plot at the moment implies one more hike. And Goldman is saying that the data is not strong enough to sit there in early May and say, we'll go again. This is, the, this is basically the conviction trade right now. Hike once more and done, and then potentially start cutting rates later this year, potentially pretty aggressively. And that's what everybody keeps coalescing around. Is the data really that soft? I keep going back to that, and people are not that convinced quite yet. Yeah, what I would say it's asymmetric. What's interesting here with this word pause is what kind of pause is it? And we've, we've mentioned this a couple times this week, but it's even more so now after that inflation report. If you pause, does that assume you cut after it? Or if you pause, do you go both ways? Dominique Constine's colleague, Stephen Rusciuto, makes really clear you can go both ways. And I think Hatsi is just setting that up with some form of pause. We well, can go one of three ways. And Mohamed Alerin has talked about this a few times with us on this program. And he wrote in about it, actually, in the last couple of days. He said, one, you can pause and then you can hold through to year end, which is implied in their dot plot. You can pause and then you can start <coughs> cutting, which is the way the market believes it works. Yeah. Or you can pause, and I think this is what Lisa might be suggesting, the risk is here. You can pause and you can start hiking again. And that can be problematic. That's the three outcomes. But to me, it's the X axis. It's not a pause for one meeting, as you say, to the end of the year. And when I say pause, 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 no one's pricing in where are we in September if we have a stasis in central American central bank policy. Lisa mentioned so, something yeah. super important in the last 20 minutes. <clears throat> it wasn't so long ago we were talking about 50 basis point interest rate hikes. That only got batted away because we had a banking shock, Lisa, over the last month. Does that come back on the table if we find out? And City, this is City's view, not my view. Andrew Hollenhorst, Veronica Clark, over at Citigroup, are pushing this idea that the fallout from the banking shop will be limited. It will be limited and will mean the Fed has to go further than the Fed is implying right now in their projections. I feel like people are not saying the quiet part out loud. The quiet part is how important is it to get back to 2% inflation? That, to me, is really the crucial issue. If people are saying the Fed should cut rates well, and be perhaps a little less restrictive, those people tend to believe it's OK if we are really patient, possibly for 10 <laughs> years, in Wait. terms of what it is uh, in terms of getting inflation back down to 2 percent. Uh, Sarah House said it on this program of Wells Fargo a number of months ago, Tom. I know you enjoyed that comment. It was about the last mile. The last mile of the effort to get inflation That's down to 2 percent. And I'm we're in that, that 4 or yeah. 5 percent window, Tom, now. And then it's the next big push. And what, are we restrictive now in that? And as Lisa says, when we turn, what do we turn at, back to? What we're going to turn to now is the shock yesterday for the commodity market. And you know it wasn't in oil. It wasn't in copper. It was in, well, dog bags for $3,500. That's what Louis Vuitton does uh, in China. And they showed bang up, boom, retail China earnings. It falls directly into optimism on the price of Brent crude. Joining us now, Amrita Sen, co-founder, head of research with four Louis Vuitton items in her house. Amrita, thank you so much for joining us this morning. <laughs> if LVMH shows us a boom China retail, do you bring that right over to $100 Brent crude? 
Well, they are not directly connected in that way, Tom. But yeah, definitely. Look, I mean, I just got back from Asia and the, there is no word, like there's no recessionary talk over there because China is reopening. Yes, China's reopening in different stages, uh, which we've put out recently in terms of, you know, making Western traders understand that not every sector is booming. Mobility is back. Every restaurant is full and you know, cars are, I mean, traffic's pretty bad there. Airline is improving. Retail sales definitely very, very strong. And now you are actually seeing housing market turn a corner, which is huge. Uh, but yes, that's probably going to take till the end of the year to fully recover. Uh, but China's recovery is very real. We've seen the import numbers come out today for March. 12.3 million barrels per day of crude oil imports uh, back to pretty much, you know, one of the highest levels ever they have imported. So there is some very, very strong demand numbers coming out of that country. And to carry it forward, LVMH really showing a boom Japan from the Straits of Malacca up. Is it a Pacific Rim boom or is it discreet to a COVID recovering China? It is specific to China in the sense that that's the last country to come out of COVID. But I don't think we should underestimate the multiplier effect China has, right? Um, because you've started to see Chinese tourists all over Asia. And a lot of airlines, for instance, haven't even reinstated a lot of the routes because they were dependent on China reopening. So I think that's what you are going to see tourism around the region pick up. Now, having said that, not everything is rosy. Manufacturing is weak because the US and Europe, um, the goods, just the goods inventory destocking cycle is in full force and we're not buying enough goods. So manufacturing is weaker, but the consumer sector is very, very strong. The reason why we're talking about this today, Amrita, is not only is this a big question geopolitically and uh, just when it comes to international economy, but it also feeds very much into inflation. The CPI report we got yesterday was Absolutely. weaker than expected in a headline basis because of what we saw in oil prices and energy prices over the past month. They have ticked materially higher on the heels of the story you are talking about. How much higher could they go in the next, say, month, two months on the heels of this China recovery? I think this is such an important question, Lisa, right? Because the issue is, I mean, our uh, colleagues at Medley Advisors think that we will get a, a 25 basis point hike in May. And sure, I mean, maybe we get a pause after that. But I think the reality is commodity prices, particularly oil, given the OPEC plus cuts together with China's reopening, will mean potentially much, much tighter markets in the second half of the year, as long as, you know, there's a mild recession in the West and it's not like 0809, which is not our expectation. If that's the case, then I think the market is so optimistic in thinking that the Fed is going to be able to cut rates because oil prices will go above $100 in the second half of the year. And that has huge implications for what the Fed has to do. Yes, there's going to be a time lag. So yes, they may not have to do anything this year, or maybe it's at the very back half of this year into 2024, uh, but there will be pressures from oil. Now, that's not the only driver of inflation. Of course, other sectors are have a very, very important uh, role to play, particularly housing. But we can't just ignore the fact that oil prices have started to take back higher. I'm not saying they will continue to rise in the short term, given all the macro fears, right? We'll get a lot of volatility. There's definitely some downside in the near term as well. But looking forward, let's say in the second half of the year, very hard for me to see oil prices not getting above $100. Crude in the 80s this morning. Amrita, always great to get your perspective on the crude market. Amrita Sen there of Energy Aspects. Crude trading in the low 80s on WTI. Getting close to 90-ish on Brent. 87 right now, Tom. This is important. Softer on the session by about a third of 1%. 87 is a print right now on Brent crude. And I'm going to go with you there. All of a sudden this morning, for the first time in ages, folks, we're looking at 90-ish. I like that. It's Amrita great. mentioned China. China's kind of fallen off the radar. We started the year, bang, let's talk about China, the reopening trade. And now it seems to have faded from the conversation, Lisa. Why is that? Well, partly because it wasn't as robust and outward facing as people were hoping that it would be. In other words, it wasn't as much travel. It wasn't as much sort of spending. Although, do the LVMH numbers, and I'm glad you brought them up, Tom. Boom. Exactly. Does that basically question how much this really has been an entirely domestic story and how much this spending is reaching some of the other economies, you know, Europe in particular, as well as yes, crude yes, uh, yes. intensive types of travel. This is important. We don't have time for it right now, but the, 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 the Dana Telsey luxury review, if you will, is a global study, not just about China. Japan numbers yesterday were outrageously up, I believe up 34%. Alpha MH, record high this morning.
record high. What a run. Coming up on this program, Jennifer McKeown, the Chief Global Economist at Capital Economics. And a little bit later this morning, we'll catch up with Gideg Openup of the IMF and David Malpass of the World Bank. Live from the nation's capital this morning. Good morning to you from the IMF World Bank <coughs> headquarters. The con conversations continuing here down in Washington, D.C. Gita Gopinath coming up a little bit later. I'll run through the guests you need to look out for in just a moment. Let's start with the price action and get you started with the equity market. Equity futures on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. Positive by almost a tenth of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100 up by two tenths of 1%. Quick snapshot of the bond market. Twos, tens, thirties look like this on a two-year yield higher by single basis points. Still just in and around 4% on a two-year Holding that range at the moment, 397.25. The range last week, though, wide, wide, wide. We traded in the 360s at one point off the back of weaker than expected data, then repriced off the back of payrolls, then repriced again the other way off the back of CPI. And Lisa's got tons to say about that, and I'm sure she'll share it with you <laughs> in the next 10 minutes. Out of 10 year right now, 342.43, yields hard by three basis points there. And let's just finish with foreign exchange, euro dollar, the euro against the US dollar, shaping up as follows, 110. Back at 110. There it is. 110.18. We're positive two tenths of 1%. A stronger euro really in the mix, TK, over the last couple of weeks again. This is a backstory right now. And I really want to set this up for our next guest, John. But the bottom line is there's this beginning of a significant dollar weakness. As we talked to Ibrahim Rabari yesterday, the idea of euros through 110, 115, a few brave enough to go to 120, and Jordan Rochester looking at sterling that changes. I mean, you know, you're not going to be able to buy the, tot the tots if, if, if this works Oh, we're out. buying the football club now. <clears throat> we're looking at okay. it. OK, you know? good to know. You know? I'm going to jump in with some I don't some know if we want it the way they're I, playing. I don't think we want it either. Maybe we'll get it on discount <clears throat> this summer. Yeah. I want to talk about the airlines just briefly. <laughs> Ooh, farce. Yeah, I know. American Airlines out with some numbers that didn't impress investors just yesterday. Doubts are out this morning, saying that they see second quarter adjusted EPS at $2 to $2.25. The estimate, Lisa, 161 I know you've got a little bit more. The number in a pre-market of stock is up by about 1.2%. Yeah, popping after uh, basically keeping their full-year adjusted EPS around 5 to $6 versus the estimate of five uh, $5.37. Here's the issue. Delta has continued to see very strong uh, revenues and very strong passenger uh, volumes, although definitely coming off just a little bit. If you take a look at the first quarter passenger revenue, it's about $10.4 billion versus the estimate of $10.56 billion. So really it is that the margins are better. And this really has been the story that we have continued to see with airlines. As I'm just saying out loud, sometimes you find that service might not be the same and you get less and you pay more. So potentially they're mm. actually getting more in the profits area. Not Talking about Delta in no, particular, just no. the broader airlines. And no, it is. I mean, when you go, it's, you know, the, you, there's always like small cutbacks in service. Their margins here. are a problem. I mean, yeah. their, their margins are small discomforts. Yeah, they're all turning into Ryanair, Tom. You know, sort there of was a fist fight, fight. Sorry, packing you on the. I, I on was the plane. on a flight. Oh, I was on a flight recently, not Delta. There was a fist fight in economy because they wouldn't take the charge card or the cash. For the beverage of your choice. Oh, right. What they got they, some what digital saying? setup thing. They're milking everything they can. They're back in row 42, milking a $6, you know, little teensy. I'm just guessing that you something. weren't sitting in row 42. I'm just going to throw that out. Well, there. I will also point out that they have now new rules where they won't serve drinks uh, up to a certain point in the ride because of behavior like that, because people are getting a bit. I thought you were going to say because of people like Tom. <laughs> I wasn't going to go. This Coming is up. Going downhill fast. <laughs> I'm going to share with you what's know, coming up a little bit later Wall this Street. morning. Extended version of Bloomberg surveillance this morning. So we'll go through to about 9.56 Eastern time, for those of you who want to be really precise, 9.56.30. David Malpass of the World Bank's coming up. Gita Gopinath of the IMF. Paolo Gentiloni of the European Commission. Raghu Rajan, good friend of this program over the years, Tom, of the University of Chicago Booth School and formerly, of course, ran the Indian Central Bank as well. And leading us with the expertise right now, Jennifer McCown Jones, Chief Global Economist, Capital Economics, and, of course, formerly working uh, with the Bank of England. Uh, Jennifer, the governor of the Bank of England is looking out there to declare victory. Can England, can Europe declare victory if many are modeling stronger sterling and stronger euro? 
Um, well, uh, no, I don't think so. Given that inflation, clearly, pr from the Bank of England's perspective, inflation is still far too high. Uh, headline rates coming down, but core, not not really. Um, and that's got to be the, the major concern. They really can't declare victory until, until that's under control. And I think what's happening really is that whereas recession risks previously were, were focused more on, on Europe, given the energy crisis, now we're shifting mm -hmm. to um, a, a different set of risks around banks and around credit which are affecting economies more broadly and the US now more coming into the mix in terms of, of recession risk. So I think really it's not about good news on the European economies, but more right. about bad news on the US. Jennifer, I'm going to be clear. Britain seems to be off the radar here. The president in Ireland yesterday with the prime minister, uh, all that is fine. And there's a very EM focus here, a banking crisis focus, China, the US. From where you are, with great respect, is Brexit been successful? <laughs> Um, goodness, um, I, I don't think we could say that at, at this stage. Exports are, are really not faring well. At, at one difficulty with it, and any analysis of Brexit at the moment is that so much has come along um, in the meantime in terms of the energy crisis, now banking turmoil. It's very difficult to strip that out and to know exactly where we stand. But certainly it is it is causing us, us problems, not least in terms of um, labour supply and labour availability, which is still a major issue in the UK and one of the things that's driving up wage growth, creating problems for, for the Bank of England. Well, we got some data this morning uh, about GDP in the United Kingdom, and we got a sense of really strong stagflation in the UK, really underperforming other G7 nations for a protracted period of time. What is that period of time, and how soon will other nations join, or is it really going to be about the UK emerging from this into something perhaps a bit better? Yeah, well, I think actually the the February GDP data surprised us a bit on, on the upside. It wasn't quite as bad as, as we'd expected. We'd anticipated a contraction. And it now looks actually like in, in Q1 as a whole, the UK economy will, will have grown, which is, is something of a relief. Um, but that said, I think things are going to get worse. The UK is going to head into a recession, probably from the second quarter as credit conditions tighten. And I think, unfortunately, other economies are going to join it. This issue of tightening credit conditions is, is broad based. Um, the slowdown in lending has been much more pronounced in Europe than in the US so far, where lending growth is still holding up very well. But I, but I think it's going, to, it's going to spread and we're going to see the lagged effects of monetary policy tightening, pushing economies into hopefully relatively modest recessions as the year goes on. Will that be enough to bring inflation down, Jennifer, given that some people argue that a lending reduction, a credit crunch, isn't enough always to really create price stability. Yeah, it's really hard to say. Our, our assumption is that, yes, it will. Um, and we've seen some encouraging signs in the latest US CPI release, rental inflation in particular, starting to come off at last. Um, but there, there is a real risk here. Um, we're still in the midst of um, a lot of strike action protests in the UK to try and push wages up and and deal with the cost of living <coughs> crisis, which, of course, will, will only um, extend the period of high inflation, high core inflation in particular. So it's a very difficult position. It's very difficult to judge just how quickly inflation will come down. And mm -hmm. we have been disappointed that the disinflationary pressures haven't fed through sooner. But certainly good shortages now seem to be a, a thing of the past. And with recessions taking hold, I think it is very likely that, that inflation will, will come down much further. Hey, Jennifer, if inflation comes down, what does real growth do? Does it come down as well, where we have a collapsing of two components? Um, yes, probably. As I said, we're, we're expecting most economies to, to head into recession, so it will, will probably be the case that, that real growth is going to dip into negative territory. But the fall in inflation, of course, that will bode well for the future, assuming that we can get core inflation down, then monetary policy should turn relatively quickly. We're expecting before the end of the year in the US, probably not too far into next year in the UK's case. And, and that will offer um, some real respite in, to, in terms of, of real growth when, when monetary policy tightening cycles reverse. Jennifer, thank you for your perspective. Jennifer McKeown <coughs> there of Capital Economics on the global economy and on central bank policy too. We mentioned Hermes a little bit later, earlier in the programme. LVMH as well, Tom, some of the luxury players. Let's just talk about LVMH just sure. briefly. These numbers, numbers are phenomenal. 
So luxury goods unit, um, fashion, leather goods, all of that stuff, rising 18% in the first quarter. That sales up 18%, mm -hmm. almost double what analysts were looking for. And on the way into IMF HQ this morning, you and I shared a ride, and Tom was talking about the growth in Japan. Let's talk about these numbers. The regional breakdown lease are just stunning. Japan, the strongest quarterly growth, rising 34% on an organic basis, followed by a 24% uplift in Europe and a 14% jump in Asia, ex-Japan. Those numbers are pretty phenomenal, Tom. I would say we talk about two Americas, maybe we talk about two globes here at the International Monetary Fund. There's an aspirational, not elite, but just aspirational, striving global audience that's looking at this stuff. I was in the Gucci in Venice uh, years ago, and there was a guy next to me in the counter holding two phones, showing product to people in China. And more importantly, there was a guy over at the other counter doing the same thing. And I mean, this is the global aspirational reach of these products. So you think it's that the wealthier individuals have more to spend, not necessarily that people no, are spending no, more broadly? No, I, I disagree with that. I think it's also some form of middle class reaching up in this time. And the media is full of all this gloom and the, hard, the tangible hardships that are out there. But there's an aspirational middle class coming out of COVID behaving like we've never seen. So I guess that, and John, I'd love your thoughts. Uh, how much is this just us waiting for Godot, waiting for this to stop, waiting for people to stop Did spending on things? I mean, it's existential Thursday, so we've got Godot coming up, uh, as always, at 645, 745. Can't wait for that. He's in the 7D, <laughs> Godot's in We're the 7D. We're going to be waiting for a I'm while. I'm hoping there's a question in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I wonder Get there, Bramah. <laughs> end up with uh, basically not coming. People continuing to spend. People have gotten accustomed to spending. We saw with Delta, they are still spending. Bookings are incredibly strong. The second quarter looks great. Are we seeing that trend? And it's not just the wealthiest. It's across the board. Until the labor market breaks. So that's the number one point, isn't it? It's the labor market. And I think this is what you're speaking to, the resilience of the U.S. labor market over the last 12 months. We had payrolls <clears> on Friday. Yeah. I know it was the smallest upside surprise, so let me frame it this way. We have not had a downside surprise on payrolls going all the way back to the March report of last year delivered in early April. And this is exactly what yeah. Neil Dutt of Renaissance Macro has been talking about for months now. We've been saying the same thing over and over again. It's going to break. Well, it's going to break. And Tom, I'll say this. This is why jobless claims has become so important, because Lisa, last week, Tom, we just started to see it break out. Let's see if that continues. It's edging up. Yeah, there's no question about it. We formed one million jobs in the last 90 days. That's just terrible. It's just terrible. Coming up on the program, not Godot, Tobias Adrian, <laughs> the director of monetary and capital Although he did go to the University of Godot. At the IMF. <laughs> that conversation coming up shortly. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Fed officials feel they need to do a little more to tame inflation and are leaning toward another interest rate hike next month. That's according to minutes from their March meeting. Now, this despite forecasts from Fed staff advisors that there will be a mild recession later this year. Another missile launch from North Korea. A suspected intercontinental ballistic missile was fired toward waters off Japan's northern island of Hokkaido. Now that prompted a brief warning from residents to take shelter. South Korea says it's possible that North Korea may have tested a new type of solid fuel missile. There's a report on the alleged leaker of those U.S. intelligence secrets. According to The Washington Post, it's a young gun enthusiast who worked on a military base and shared the classified documents with a group on Discord, an online platform used by gamers. He was known as OG and told the group he spent some time inside a secure facility. Discord says it's cooperating with authorities. Ukraine says it has won an arbitration case against Russia. That will require Moscow to pay $5 billion. It has to do with Russia's seizure of Ukrainian natural gas assets in Crimea, which Russia annexed in 2014. There's been no confirmation from the Hague's arbitration tribunal. And shares of LVMH soared to a record today in France. The parent of Louis Vuitton, Dior, and dozens of other luxury brands saw strong growth in Asia as Chinese shoppers bounce back from strict COVID lockdown. Still, LVMH is seeing a slowdown in the U.S. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
our forecasts are significantly better than the IMF forecast. But what I should say is that last year we were the fastest growing economy in the G7. We are very confident about the UK's medium and longer term prospects, but we don't pretend that we're, going, we're not going through a difficult period. Like everyone, we're dealing with very high inflation, which we have to bring down. Another country that does not share the gloom of the International Monetary Fund. Jeremy Hunt there, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, speaking with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. You can catch that interview in full on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal as well. UK GDP this morning, Tom, not fantastic. Stagnating in the early part of this year, unchanged off the back of strikes and that individual right. hoping that things improve from hoping. here on out. You bring up a really important point. How can elected officials agree with Kristalina Gorgieva over a five-year global growth of 3%, they'd be, they'd be, he'd be out of his job. Politics. Politics. Secretary Yellen part of that politics this week as well? Yeah, I, th I think I so. I would think so too. I, 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 it's just, it's, it's un-American, un-British to follow the IMF line and where GDP's going. Well, I think it's but, political suicide to commit to gloom in our future. Yeah, it is. Well, what do you think, Lisa? I mean, you know. I think I'm not going into politics. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the next 12 months and you're not going to like it. <laughs> no one's going to like it. I don't think that would work Let's out. Let's save everybody. Uh, well, <laughs> we'll have to see. Let's do this. Because of time, we need to speak to the most important person at the International Monetary Fund, this is the gentleman when he speaks and speaks in this moment of post-pandemic. Well, guess what? The room is silent. Silent. Tobias Adrian is director of monetary and capital markets at the IMF. What that means, he's in charge of the Green Book and all around financial stability here. He has enjoyed a recent American banking crisis. You people put out PhD fancy spider charts which show the different factors that are of challenge right now. Which spider chart and which factor in that chart matters right now? Yeah, so uh, I think what we have seen in recent months is that uh, banking stocks uh, have sold off uh, quite a bit, in particular in the US and Europe, but the market more broadly has been fairly stable. <coughs> um, so financial conditions have tightened to some extent, but it's really in the banking sector mm -hmm. that we have seen most of, of, of the tightening. And that could have consequences down the line for macro activity. I want to go to your work at MIT with Olivier Blanchard. He's all the rage. He's my book of the summer with wonderful difference equations on R starred. Fold in the theory right now to the hardcore pragmatic realities of macroeconomics. Does theory matter right now? Does R starred matter? Absolutely. We published a chapter uh, just earlier this week that is looking at our star. And in our assessment, and that is very much aligned with what the market pricing is telling us as well, is that interest rates are going to come down in the medium term. Of course, at the moment they are elevated, central banks have to fight inflation and then have to keep monetary policy tight. But over time, we do expect uh, interest rates to come back down to our star, which we estimate to be similar to pre-COVID. Do you think we've seen evidence that this banking system can't handle interest rates at close to 5% at the Federal Reserve? Uh, there's certainly stress in the banks and in the non-banking system, right? We have seen turbulence in both banks and non-bank financial institutions. And uh, there's always a distribution of how much exposure there is to interest rate risk, to duration risk. And some of the weaker players have been under tremendous stress. Um, and there are certainly uh, possibilities that further stress could uh, be triggered at some point. And clearly there were some badly managed institutions and we won't talk about them individually, but one Fed official said earlier this week that he does not think that it was because the Federal Reserve went from zero to five in 12 months. Is that an assessment that you share? So I don't think it's the speed per se uh, that is at play here, but I do think that the rise in interest rates has been putting pressure on institutions. There are these unrealized losses, which are in the public domain and which have made headlines around the events uh, over the past month. Well, do you think, just to sort of put a bow on this, do you think that the stress shows that it is not worth it to necessarily <clears throat> raise rates further from here and cause that sort of more systemic stress in order to more rapidly get inflation back down to where it was pre-pandemic? So the first order goal for central banks at the moment is to bring inflation back to target. I think there's no question about that. 
And uh, both the US policymakers and the Swiss policymakers have been very successful in deploying other tools to ensure financial stability. There were aggressive actions uh, in terms of lending and deposit insurance to contain any fallout. Uh, and that allows monetary policy to continue to tighten to fight inflation. Inflation is a big problem, and inflation has to come back to target. We've talked a lot about trying to separate <coughs> two things, yeah. financial stability from uh, monetary policy fighting inflation. Eh, they're getting a little fuzzier, especially from the minutes where clearly you have Fed officials pulling back from some of the rate hikes. Do you think that a credit crunch is disinflationary? There's certainly going to be an impact from the higher cost of capital of banks on their bank lending behavior. We have numbers in the GFSR. We estimate that to be about 0.45% in the US and a similar magnitude in Europe. <clears throat> so there is going to be an impact in our assessment from bank lending on real output. And that, of course, is going to feed back into monetary policy decisions, absolutely. Okay, so basically, do you think that right now developed markets should not raise rates further and that they should just tolerate inflation being higher for ha perhaps a bit longer with faith that it will get back in the IMF's view to where it was pre-pandemic? So uh, we don't have the definite answer yet. It depends on uh, releases around inflation. There could be upside surprises to inflation that may uh, need further tightening of monetary policy. So, you know, policy going forward is very much dependent on data, in particular on how core inflation evolves. Well, let's talk about the data that might influence how core inflation evolves. Have you seen evidence that credit is contracting, that bank lending is contracting in America? Oh, absolutely. We have seen uh, a couple of data releases that have shown a certain amount of tightening in uh, credit underwriting standards as well as in the overall level of credit. Can I be blunt then? What on earth was the Treasury Secretary talking about earlier this week? Uh, so um, I would distinguish a baseline and an adverse scenario. And I think uh, the Treasury Secretary was talking about the baseline. When you look at markets, you know, the market implied inflation is coming back to sure. target fairly quickly. You're being kind because I think she said she saw no evidence of lending contracting. And you've said we do. Yeah, absolutely. There is certainly uh, evidence in the data of some contraction in lending and some tightening of uh, lending standards. Lisa, what a situation. Some real daylight, again, between the IMF, and we're all looking at the same data, <clears throat> and the politicians, and the Treasury Secretary in the IMF is one example. Chancellor Hunt is another example of the same thing, although that's about projections and not realised information, but still. We dismiss that as politics, uh, but uh, I would love your, your answer with that, Tobias what the policy implications are of the politics of not reflecting the pain that is likely to uh, occur when you get the policy prescription that you think is necessary to bring down inflation. So absolutely, I think monetary policy is being tightened and that is partially transmitted through bank lending. That's the classic bank lending channel. And um, you know, to get inflation down, of course, uh, economic activity has to come down to some degree. We're out of time, but I've got one real important question. I'm going to bounce it off Robin Wigglesworth's wonderful tour de force on debt in China and restructuring today in the FT. Just simply, if China is reticent to join the West in restructuring debt, does that change your financial stability? So uh, many countries are in debt restructuring uh, negotiations, and there are many players that are important. You're mentioning uh, one of them. Uh, and for those countries, it is extremely first order to get the debt restructured. For the moment, uh, the countries that are impacted are smaller countries. So relative to global capital markets, I think uh, that uh, mm. will not lead to broader contagion. Tobias, this was wonderful. So, Thanks thank for waking you. up early. I mean, this is like... Yeah. In Washington? This is like lunchtime. This is two hours this is, early. This is like yeah, 2 a.m. You know. For someone they walk, in DC, they, isn't they, it? They open wow. the doors here at 8.30. You is might. that right? Usually. That's early, early arrivals. Tobias, thank you. Tobias, Tobias comes in like a polite the IMF, 10 Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> Two-hour lunch. Very Do you cool. know that on 19th Street above it, you were mentioning earlier, yeah. the kindness here, there's a big, beautiful marble sculpture that says, be kind. Are we being kind? No, the IMF. They have a big, <laughs> big yeah, marble sculpture. I think you just said no. We have to be kind. No, we don't have to be kind, but the IMF, you're always kind. Coming up, so you mentioned China and debt restructuring. David Melpass, 
of the World Bank. Yeah, Looking forward to that World conversation. Bank. It's a big topic for him and has been mm -hmm. for a while. Gita Gopinath of the IMF coming up as well. And Raghuraja, formerly of the Indian Central Bank, now of the University of Chicago Booth School. Looking forward to that conversation too. Equity futures positive by almost a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Live from the nation's capital through the next couple of days from the IMF Global headquarters. This is Bloomberg. I wouldn't read a huge amount into this report in terms of giving the all clear. When you look at the data right now, what we have to realize is that they are backward looking. Even away from the banking stresses, we think now would be a very good time to pause and reassess. I think they're going to go ahead and hike at the May meeting as well and then take their pause. And I think you have recession coming later this year. We're still a long way from 2% at this point. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, live from the IMF Spring Meetings in Washington, D.C with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from the nation's capital for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio from IMF Global HQ here in Washington, D.C., alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow with Equity Futures on the S&P 500, positive by around about a tenth of 1%. TK, we need to talk about a little division here in Washington between the IMF and certain select politicians. Earlier on this week, Secretary Yellen was in Washington doing a news conference and suggested she'd seen no evidence of bank lending contracting in the United States of America. We caught up with the IMF, an official from the International Monetary Fund, literally in the last 10 minutes, who said completely the opposite. Let's transition to the UK and talk about projections. A pretty gloomy outlook from the IMF right. for the global economy, including the United Kingdom. Chancellor Hunt is entitled to his view. Spoke to Maria Tadeo of Bloomberg and come out and said, Tom, I disagree with the view from the IMF. I mean, there's different narratives here involved. Let's say there's six, seven, eight narratives. We don't have time for that right now. But the polarity of narratives is simple. Some enthusiasm about a consumer, a continued growth globally, and completely on the other side is an IMF, and I think of Michael Darda at Roth MKM, who are suggesting diminished inflation and diminished real GDP on an American and global basis. These are huge contrasts. Is this just the daylight, the contrast, Lisa, between politics and economics? Or is it something a little bit more than that? Well, this is a great question because are we talking shades of restriction or are we talking an inability to really telegraph what is required to get inflation under control? And if that's the case, as I was asking uh, Adrian uh, Tobias there, how much does this reflect <clears throat> an unwillingness on the part of policymakers to do what's necessary to bring inflation under control? And here is where the patience and transitory question lies in. You know, can we tolerate 4% inflation? Inflation for three years if we believe that we're going to get down to 2%. And oh, yeah, by the way, this, we also save this, jobs. This is the political overlay of macroeconomics, and indeed, I would suggest microeconomics. And the massive overlay here in every article, every discussion, is the fragmentation the managing director speaks about, which is United States and China. And that's the quite. We were talking here today. Uh, uh, Tobias Adrian, and he made very clear he's not going to say the word China. What do you think that is? They're hypersensitive to not drawing themselves into this debate, even though the managing director is constructive about her recent visit to China. These are go to Zambia. We don't need this is way too early on morning American TV for this, but go to the Z letter, go to Zambia, and that workout. With Zambia, that workout with the West, the Paris Club, the London Club. I love what Robin said about this this morning. It's almost like there needs to be a Beijing Club because China's so involved. Well, Tom, the IMF hasn't been shy about criticizing other countries, been very bold about criticizing the United Kingdom repeatedly over the last decade and did so under Prime Minister Trust. So, what are they afraid of? Are you I... suggesting they're afraid of not saying something about? What is the defining moment in the global economy? I think the defining the... relationship, Lisa, which is the United States. And China. There's a clear academic construct right now that China is being overt in their criticism, and how do we respond to that is a huge part of the debate. 
Well, and I also would argue this becomes very fraught because IMF includes China as one of the members. The World Bank includes China as one of the members. And yes, China is a big lender globally, both on its own as well as with the IMF and is a big contributor to some of the budget. So it becomes a real fraught discussion real quick. David Malpass of the World Bank is coming up a little bit later. He's been very outspoken on this issue and I look forward to catching up with him yeah. again. On that matter, we'll catch up with Gita Gopanath as well. Lisa's going to run you through the day ahead, some of the economic data, some of the great interviews we've got lined up for you as well through this morning. Before we get to that, let's start with the price action. The S&P 500, just about positive on the S&P by a tenth of 1%, a lift here in the equity market. Yields on a 10-year higher by three basis points, 342. 43, let's just call it 342. In the FX market, reclaiming 110 on euro dollar. I think you have to go back to early February when we saw 110.33. That was the day of the ECB and the day before that monster payrolls report, which engineered a snapback in the US dollar. But over the last several weeks, Lisa, you've seen it. The euro on a comeback, the dollar on a come down. And the debate will be, is this dollar weakness or is this euro strength? And people continue to debate that. And I wonder how much LVMH kind of feeds into that in the China story. We'll talk about that coming up. 8.30 a.m., we get the economic data that matters this morning, U.S. jobless claims, as well as March producer price data. The jobless claims information, to me, is getting more and more interesting as we start to see just a slight uptick in people uh, filing for uh, benefits after losing their jobs. Today, we also, of course, are following the IMF and World Bank meetings. Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem will be speaking, ECB Governing Council Member Joaquim Nagel as well. And on Bloomberg Television, we've been talking about our uh, discussion with David Malpass, which I'm very excited to say uh, will be coming up. And also Gita Gopinath of the IMF, especially after they made this call on inflation and rates going back to pre-pandemic how long will it take may be the key question. 1 p.m., the U.S. is selling $18 billion of 30-year bonds, and here is where the question really comes to bear. Right, John? At what point are people going to price in that inflation is going to remain hot for a very long time because no policymaker will ever have the conviction to really cause the pain required to bring inflation lower in a structurally different kind of economy. Maybe the banking shop will do it for them. This from Torsten Slock of Apollo just moments ago. Credit conditions have tightened significantly for small businesses following the SVB failure. Firms, Tom, with less than 500 employees account for almost 50 percent of total employment in the U.S. economy. That's the latest from Torsten this morning. And what's interesting is when the data dependency begins to weaken, it's when things are moving quickly. And I think everyone at these Washington meetings would assess we're seeing an accelerant now of present data, which changes that confidence in ex-post data dependency. So let's get to Daryl Kronk from yeah. Wells Fargo, the Chief Investment Officer for Wealth and Investment Management. Daryl, can I just start with the bank earnings, which are due to start pouring out tomorrow morning? What are you looking for from the C-suite, from corporate guidance? Well, good morning, everyone. And it's a fascinating discussion this morning. I do think you're going to see some pressure and some, let's call it conservativeness, conservativeness out of the bank earnings tomorrow. What's interesting is if you look at the loan data from just simply last week, because we get high frequency loan data, last week was the weakest loan data or most contraction for any single week since 2010. So going back to the prior conversation about, you know, are things weakening? Are they slowing down? Absolutely. Understand financial conditions and lending tighten before loans do. Loans are a lagging indicator, not a leading in indicator. So you'll see loans come. And I think to your point on, on the banks and earnings, John, I mean, what's really important here is if you think about the normal sequence, it's a liquidity event into a profitability event, which could then lead into a credit event in right. that sequence, right? That's how history has always taught us it plays out. I can't say enough, Daryl, about that analysis and particularly the profitability part and that folds into your research note on small caps. Does Wells Fargo abandon small caps here because of the present <laughs> fragility? Well, you have to certainly uh, uh, look at them in an unfavorable way, and that's where we've been positioned for some time. What's interesting, Tom, is small caps have had a full round trip already this year. So from January 1 to early February, small caps went up 15%, and then they gave it all back from early February to late March, basically. Certainly the earnings are going to be challenged there as small businesses have to pull in their reins and just can't get access to credit at the levels that they need or are used to. And the credit that they can get, they're gonna pay higher for. 
So if you look at small caps, even from a technical standpoint, they're actually stuck below the 200-day moving average. The reality is if this rally we've seen over the last couple of weeks is durable and sustainable, small caps should be participating, if not outright leading, and the reality is they're just not. Well, Daryl, so basically you're saying that you don't see this equity rally as sustainable. Is that correct? Yeah, we would fade it up here around 4,100. Um, I think the last time I was on the show, we were about 4,150, 4,160. Um, continue to be cautious here. You're just not getting paid to take um, risk on an equity risk premium at this level. The reality is um, that day will come. It's just not here yet, in our opinion. And, and earnings still have to come down, in our opinion. Okay, so at what point will the earnings that we're seeing from Delta, from LVMH, give you confidence that people still are spending money, still have it to spend, and uh, some of these companies are able to capitalize even bigger margins than they used to? Yeah, that's, that is the interesting point, Lisa, because I think what you'll see in this total quarterly earnings, obviously we know earnings are going to contract. The bottoms up consensus is about 6%. They'll beat, they'll come in better than that, it'll, but it'll still be the second negative quarter in a row where all the pressure is at is on the margin line. And what that's telling you is companies aren't able to raise prices at the level they were able to in 2022 and 2021 to sustain that. So as cost pressures remain high, think higher inflation, um, and yet you can't increase prices, all of that goes straight to the margin line and we think it's gonna just accelerate some of that pressure on earnings as we go later into this year. Hey, Darrell, this was great. Going into earnings season with the banks on deck tomorrow morning. Darrell Cronk there of the Wells Fargo <coughs> Investment Institute. For all this gloom, if you listened to this program over the last 70 minutes, would you have guessed that unemployment in America, Lisa, was at 3.5%? No, that's exactly the issue, is that basically for all the gloom, there's a lot of positivity that the bulls will look around and say, well, you know, why are you guys ignoring that? Okay, you mentioned Neil Dutta earlier. I'm going to go to Core Dutta uh, right now, and that is inflation comes in and doesn't impinge on a little bit of wage growth, maybe not a lot, but real incomes flatline or improve given disinflation, and that goes into consumption as well. That's the bullish view. That's yes, what the bullish would that, love. I mean, but, that is the bullish view. Or does it just take you away from the convenient gloom everybody's feeling? This convenient so gloom. It's not convenient. Yeah. It's painful. You Honestly, are, I will say, love, before we get into some sort of, you know, therapy session, there is this issue <laughs> of what we get when it comes to... That's not a danger of that. Go on. Of course not. Let's uh, just talk about it with Godot. But I do wonder if looking forward, that view right. is going to allow the disinflation that we need, though. Again, this goes back now, to, should we tolerate a higher inflation rate? In the United States. Do you know they're setting up a band behind us? I noticed that. Did you notice that? Yeah. It's the Canadians have come. You know who's playing here this who's, morning who's for, for Dr. Gorgieva? Nickelback's here. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I haven't heard from them for a long time. Are you time. making that up? Really? I don't know. Really? Nickelback's here. Oh. You've started to believe these stories. <laughs> I'm just wondering. There's a rule of Bloomberg surveillance. Allow me to share it with you. <laughs> Never <laughs> believe these stories. Mike Wilson, the CIO and Chief U.S. Equity Strategist at Morgan Stanley, joining us in about an hour from now. Much more from IMF World Headquarters here in Washington, D.C. Gita Gopinath for the IMF. David Malpass of the World Bank. Malpass, up next. You got me. I believed it for a second. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, the White House is rejecting an outlook for the economy by Federal Reserve staff. Fed Minutes published on Wednesday said the staff sees a mild recession starting later this year. But a White House spokeswoman says the data doesn't indicate that, pointing out recent numbers on jobs and consumer spending. The British economy took a bigger hit than expected from all those public sector strikes. It stalled in February, but a stronger January reading of the GDP reduces the risk of recession this year. Still, the UK is on track for an extended period of stagnation. In China, exports unexpectedly rose in March. They jumped 14.8 percent in U.S. dollar terms from a year earlier. Demand from Europe and most Asian countries improved. That boosts the economy's outlook and indicates global growth may be better than expected. A federal appeals court will allow limited access to the abortion pill. A three-judge panel partly granted the Biden administration's request to put on hold a Texas court ruling that overturned FDA approval of the medication. On the other hand, it allowed restrictions on abortion that were lifted since 2016 to be reinstated. 
Global news powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Looking ahead, there are good reasons to think that policy may have to tighten more to bring inflation down. But there are also good reasons to think that the economy may continue to slow, even without additional policy adjustments. That was Mary Daly, the San Francisco Fed president. Plenty of Fed speak through the week. I have to say some cracks in the enthusiasm over hiking too much later on this year. Implied yes. in their projections is one more hike, and some people may be even suggesting they wouldn't go that far if we get more incoming information on the banking stress which has developed over the last month. Allow me to share with you the price action of the morning so far. Equity futures positive by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields bleeding just a little bit oh, higher in the bond market. Euro. Up a couple of basis points, up three basis points to 342. But there it is. We reclaim 110 on euro dollar, Tom. 110. 13. I'll be like uh, the pros look at euro yen, triangulate dollar and euro over to yen. I don't see a breakout there, a technical change, if you would, but there we are. One close to highs of the year. year, very close. To save every second year and every minute right now at these meetings of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, an annual visit with David Malpass, outgoing president of the World Bank. And instead of talking World Bank affairs, aid to the world and the struggles of the war in Ukraine, we will hearken back to Mr. Malpass's moment of 07 and 08. More than anyone in this building and set of buildings, he lived front and center at Bear Stearns previous financial collapse. David, thank you so much for being with us. I'm not going to ask you an easy question like, does it allude back to 08 right now? But the stresses that you see right now in American banking, in the huge tensions between China and the United States, does it lead to that word suddenly, where suddenly things can change, as they did in 08? Hi, Tom. Hi, everyone. Um, so the, it, there were big. There was a maturity mismatch going on then too, and it uh, maybe from the same causes. Remember, in the in the 2000s, uh, interest rates were being raised very slowly, and so that built up a giant maturity mm -hmm. mismatch, uh, which uh, uh, some companies were funding with repos, funding treasuries. So in uh, treasury bonds, and so in that way, it harkens to now. Uh, it, we. We have uh, in the U.S. banking system, some uh, banks are funding b treasury bonds with deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, but a big difference now is the biggest dura duration mismatch is the Federal Reserve itself. It funds with, oh, uses overnight uh, borrowing to fund a giant bond portfolio, some $9 trillion. The European Central Bank, $8 trillion. And I, th I think the dominant feature now is the asset allocation that came out of that. If you have <clears throat> giant buyers of right. long maturity, of, of duration. In, in effect, the central banks were buying giant d duration. And so what right. that meant is it distorted all world markets, and we're now in the workout phase. There'll have to be a normalization of interest rates. It means at pressure on asset prices for a long period of time. That's what's showing up in the meetings here, the, the, the expectation that there'll be weak growth for a while puts well, pressure on people in developing countries uh, throughout the world, and that pressure is getting intense. Frame the distinction between the World Bank weak growth call and that of your colleagues at the International Monetary Fund. Both of you, to editorialize, have been grim. What's the Malpassian level of grim in your forecast? Well, Ours are, ours are a little weaker than the than the uh, IMFs, but remember they often do one in purchasing power parity. So if you adjust for that, there's not that much difference. Uh, we use market-based exchange rates, and yeah. so we, ours is two, and theirs I think would work out to 2.4. So they're both and weak weak forecasts for 2023, uh, and that's showing up in the U.S. You saw the Federal Reserve saying maybe in the U.S. a recession, mild recession in the second right. half. Right. What's great about this is Mel Pass uses a slide rule from Colorado College. Uh, oh, very cool. Uh, uh, 
Calculate. So this is growth. Let's talk about debt, if we can. Uh -huh. This is something you've been really outspoken about, mm -hmm. David, over the last few years. China, the world's biggest creditor to poor nations. I understand there's been some conversations this week. What's their position now, if we could start there? And then if you could tell me whether you're satisfied with it. Uh, the, the debt has grown up over the years. The, con, con, the, uh, the composition of the debt is different from uh, in the old days. That used to be U.S. banks that were lending to foreign countries. Now we have China uh, and Euro, the euro bond market lending to developing countries, sovereign debt. So there was extensive talk yesterday. I co-chaired with Kristalina the, the debt roundtable. China came at the level of the PBOC governor and also the minister of finance of China uh, and so they participate in the discussion and there was there were some agreements uh, there was agreements that there needed to be more timeliness of the uh, launching into a restructuring process that there needed to be da data sharing China has asked from the beginning can't we get the data earlier that hasn't been the tradition but that's going to be and there's a there's a paper to do that also a working group which is important on the technicalities of uh, burden sharing how how do you have equal burden sharing among creditors so that they all participate in the restructuring process of the debt this is really important to the people in developing countries because their governments are paying these large high n not low interest rate kind of market rate or above market rate uh, debt and it means it's draining the countries of what they need for nutrition for health uh, for education for climate adaptation are you satisfied with what China's committed to or do you need to see more? We need to see this week, and it was mentioned last night. Yesterday there were big meetings, so uh, we had the, the uh, G20 meeting, the G7 uh, meeting of finance ministers, the development committee, the governors of the World Bank met and expressed st strong support for the World Bank leadership. Uh, there, there were, uh, and there was discussion at the <coughs> G20, even late last night, of the specific countries that needed to get action on debt relief. Zambia was here. I had a panel earlier this week with the Zambian finance minister, the Ethiopian finance minister. They're burdened by high levels of debt. So the, the proof is in the pudding. The, the, the details of is Zambia going to get a mem, uh, an MOU? We'd like to see one this week. China needs to be willing to sign off on the structure of the restructuring. One big question has been transparency and a lack of it and a lack of understanding of just how much debt China has extended to a lot of developing nations. Do you walk away from the meetings yesterday with a greater sense of how much debt they currently have tied to the developing world? Um, we know quite a bit about it, but not not the full extent. And uh, there were calls yesterday, and there's specific discussion of this, that uh, some people say swap lines by China's central bank should be left out of the restructuring. Uh, some say it should be included in the restructuring. There was uh, talk about the, the uh, what to do in, uh, with arrears. So as these uh, restructurings drag on, the, uh, the interest on the interest uh, goes up and up. So can you agree in advance on how to handle that? And so it gets straight into the details. There was a, there was a uh, uh, proposal made uh, that uh, it, well, the proposals across the board on how to handle this. So I think there's lots more work to be done, but at least there's a technical or a workshop that's going to be set up to, to bring people up to speed on how you calculate net present value reduction within a debt restructuring. Would you identify this? and everything we've just discussed over the last few minutes as the number one issue that you're handing over to your successor at the World Bank? Well, certainly debt transparency is, uh, is a giant issue. There was, there was a call yesterday for the debtor countries to release the contracts that have non-disclosure clauses. So that's a specific thing that will, be, that will uh, outlast me, uh, and it's not going to get resolved this week, but I hope it does. You know, the, 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 the uh, China has written into the contracts non-disclosure clauses. That was specifically discussed. So as we look toward the future, I think what I'm handing over to my successor is a World Bank that's in really good shape. Uh, that was that was a main theme from yet from yesterday's meetings. But 
also in a developing world that's under this giant pressure uh, from too much debt, but also not enough growth mm -hmm. coming out of the advanced economies. Well, this won't be the end of our conversations. You know that. It's great to catch up, David, as always. David Malpass there. Nice to see you. The president's arm of the World Bank. I think that these are challenging issues. You, know, you talk about the World Bank and aid, and we spent the entire time on debt restructuring. This is the milieu we're in. I talked about education, about health. Here, but the, David, we have to go to poverty. <laughs> 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 David, David knows that. He's just not done. You, you can stick around for Gita Gopinath if you like. He's coming up from the IMF a little bit later this hour. From Washington, D.C. this morning, good morning. Kelsey Barrow of J.P. Morgan coming up next. Live from Washington, D.C. this morning, good morning to you all from the IMF Global Headquarters here in the nation's capital. Counting it down to the opening bell a couple of hours from now, the market action looking a little something like this on the S&P 500. Equity futures slightly positive by a tenth of 1% on the Nasdaq. The Nasdaq 100 up by a third of 1% this morning. Just a little bit of a lift in the equity market. No real drama here. The next stop, jobless claims, which are due in about an hour from now. Then on to tomorrow, retail sales and a ton of banking earnings. So we're going to do a lot on the banks for you tomorrow. Going into all of that, twos, tens, thirties look like this on a two-year <coughs> at the moment. Yields. In America, higher by a single basis point, 397 on a 10-year high by two or three basis points to 342. Again, no drama there for once at the front end of the curve. Pretty muted price action with the exception of the move off the back of the CPI report just yesterday. I want to finish on foreign exchange. Here we go. Euro dollar back at 110. It's saying something. Yeah, euro dollar 110.16, positive two tenths of 1%. That Tom, a slightly stronger euro in the mix this morning, slightly weaker dollar. They, there's equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, and cardinal rule number one is the weighting changes and the dynamics change. And foreign exchange has been pretty quiet. And maybe this is the wake up getting out through the summer of finally a giveaway in the dollar. With all the dynamics going on, is that one outcome? And it, it bears really close watching. So it was interesting yesterday watching the price action off the back of CPI. Yeah. You saw yields drop quite aggressively and then come back, Lisa. You saw the dollar weaken quite aggressively and then and not come back. <laughs> and that's been a story this morning with the euro dollar too. Well, and again, that's why I go back to is this dollar weakness or is this euro strength? Because are we getting some sort of strong resounding sense that Europe is in a better position? Yeah. Or is this really a feeling that the U.S. is done with rate hikes or perhaps one more and then we'll be cutting into the end of the year? I, I strongly support the study of an asymmetry like that. But then when you triangulate it with another pair, it becomes even more powerful. So the pro case is... Euro dollar, dollar yen, and then take out the dollar, what euro yen dynamics do, and that'll be something to watch. Yeah. Listening to the Bank of France governor this morning, I didn't hear the enthusiasm to keep on hiking after the next meeting at all. I still don't believe, and for what it's worth, this market still does not believe in this idea that there is a second sequence to this. And the first part of the effort is to get rates up right. really quickly. And this is what Kashgari talked about in that blog to start the year. There is a second piece of this, and it's the waiting and the waiting, yeah. and the waiting. And the market doesn't see it that way. If you speak to people in financial markets, they see the pause and cutting <clears throat> as part of the same story. And the Federal Reserve and the ECB do not see that story at all in any way, shape, or form. They see a pause and a hold for a long, long time. Yeah, I mean, look, this is the unknown. And a lot of people yesterday came on, including Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock, and said, you know what? We aren't buying what the market is selling. We think that they're perhaps a little ahead of themselves with the rate cuts. That said, you've pointed this out before, John, that where if you hold, it becomes a whole lot more restrictive as the economy continues to slow. We talk about slowing economy, but I have to say, you're not seeing it when it comes to uh, consumer spending. We talked about LVMH. Those shares uh, a little changed ahead of the market open after rising to a record. But I wanted just to give you a sense before going into the airlines of just how much the Chinese consumer is really driving action with <laughs> this is to me amazing organic sales of the group's biggest unit rose 18 percent which was twice the gain the analysts were expecting so how much is this people really coming in and having a lot of money to fly around and to buy luxury goods Delta also out this morning they actually missed on the first quarter but they expect the second quarter to be much above expectations those shares up nearly three percent and this is what I find interesting the revenue 
per passenger is going up and exceeded expectations. Again, Sucks. I go this. I'm not surprised. I mean, <laughs> I'm not either, right? So this is basically margins increasing despite all of the discussion about contracting margins because guess yeah. what? They can. I look at the ratio of business class to economy. It used to be two to one, three to one. Sometimes now it's seven to one. And critically, that ratio is within economy going up to stupid levels. Yeah. The, the new three hundred dollar oh, flight so expensive. is six fifty seven hundred. So so expensive. You know, it's and a lot nuts. of these airlines are packing out the business cabin now as well. Yes, that they're expanding them. Yes, and correct. and dropping the first class cabin in some of these planes as well. At least yeah, that's I've the seen direction of travel. I've, I've noticed yeah. that. I'm sure I've, you have. I've noticed that. You used yes, to sit there. Much yeah. Mm. Anyway, the other airlines are also <laughs> popping uh, in sympathy. Although American Airlines less than United, which I think is interesting. United and Delta kind of. Shifting away from American a little interesting, bit. Interesting, interesting. Could. Subscribe, yes. subscribe. It's that time in the morning where I say subscribe because Lisa's paying for breakfast a little bit later. <clears throat> Sign up at Bloomberg.com. <laughs> The enthusiasm is just shocking. For the right Bramo now. newsletter. I've been promoing this all the time. I, I love your work, Bramo. Mm. You know that. <laughs> the surveillance newsletter, bloomberg.com forward slash surveillance. We are going to change the name of that, Tom, toxic in the next couple of days. Yeah. Thanks Give it a few days. Surveillance toxic brew. Oh, without a doubt. How do you do it's it every day? The Quickly. daily toxic brew. We, we got to get, to, we gotta get to Kelsey here. How do you grind this out every day in there, your, you know, six-hour work? There is a team, first of all, of people who are incredibly is, helpful. We have ghost awesome. team? The, we, no. A, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> have, you got, have you got ghost writers? Is that what you're I suggesting? Say, I will say this. There is usually when we come in, and I know that you guys do the same thing. Mm. There is a theme that you believe in that you kind of test yeah, out every coffee? day. Where's coffee? That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> you sort of see where it goes and then you figure it out. Okay. You, we have, you know, stuff that comes But it's out. you writing it, right? Mm -hmm. okay. She doesn't even look. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so come on. That is just so true. Misinformation. I'm working with Lisa Abramowitz. Oh, wow. my word. Got a team of writers. Hi. We will continue. Case Kelsey Barrow's waiting very uh, patiently. You want to read in on this, on what the big change, at, at what they're doing here? Oh, yeah, look, this is the, the view from Kelsey Barrow this morning. I'll bring you the quote just briefly. Sure. Whether or not the Fed follows through with a rate hike in May is mostly irrelevant to us. The U.S. economy is increasingly showing signs of weakening growth and disinflation and is more vulnerable to shocks after more than a year of aggressive policy tightening. To that end, and here's the call, Tom, we continue mm. to have a bias to lower Treasury yields and a steeper Treasury curve. Global Wall Street lean forward now because when the facts change, Kelsey Barrow changes. She works at fixed income, JP Morgan Asset Management. What an abrupt move, Kelsey, here. Let's get a benchmark on a 10-year yield. How low can it go? Can it go three or can it go 2.xx? Right. So our bias is for Treasury yields to move lower. We're expecting uh, through two-year and the 10-year uh, Treasury yield uh, to move towards 3%. So that implies that the yield curve is going to uninvert and it's actually going to start steepening. Um, so the things that we're watching right now that are leading us to that conclusion and increasing our confidence around this, you know, you've been mentioning, do we have to wait till the senior loan officer survey? That's all the way in May. Well, we're seeing data that's already showing that credit conditions are tightening. So I'll just give you a few examples. NFIB, that came out on Monday. It has a subcomponent about availability of loans. That's the lowest level since 2012. Another one, uh, the American Bankers Association also have a credit conditions index. It's the lowest since COVID and even lower than the GFC. <clears throat> um, you know, so we're seeing it really right. across the board. The credit condition tightening is occurring. If I'm going to speculate in the land of Michael and Barrow, what duration do I want to buy to go price up, yield down? What's the most effective duration? So, well, when we're thinking about the view that the yield curve is going to steepen as well as yields are going to fall, that would imply you want to, you know, have some of your duration in the front end of the curve because that's going to give you your biggest bang for your buck. Um, but on the other hand, we do think that there is merit in in locking in longer term yields here as well. Um, this has been a historic repricing in bonds and you haven't yet missed the moment um, to lock those rates in, even though we have seen a, a rally uh, so far this year. Um, and so that's really what we're looking at. We feel right now that we're, we're in this in between time, this waiting period. It's this period before uh, when the Fed stops hiking rates 
and uh, before the Fed starts cutting. And in that period of time, you have the soft landing camp, the hard landing camp, and the recession camp all claiming that they're right. And in reality, what happens is, is on the path to a recession, we go through a period that looks like a soft landing. So there's been a bit of an improvement in liquidity and in sentiment more recently. Uh, we wouldn't get complacent about that. We think it's probably temporary. And the next thing we're focused on is bank earnings uh, as well as the debt ceiling. So, Kelsey, it's a transitory soft landing, and we perhaps will see a transitory uh, type of inflation that will move to something that's lower. How long do we have to wait with inflation well above the Fed's target before it's no longer transitory and we're actually just looking at, say, 4 3.5% inflation that is basically the new normal for years on out? So we, we do have to acknowledge that year-over-year year inflation is still high, and that's, of course, a reflection of what's happened over the last 12 months. But, you know, when we look into the CPI report, we see a, a number of indicators that suggest that inflation should be coming down, that there is more disinflation in the pipeline. So on the good side, supplier deliveries within the ISM are at the lowest level since 2009. Now, if you're at home, map that index supplier deliveries to core CPI, and you're going to see there's a very tight fit, and it suggests there's a lot more disinflation in the pipeline. Now, when I show that to people, the pushback is, well, what about wages? Well, on the wage side, average hourly earnings, the three-month run rate, it's declined to the lowest level, 3.2%. Um, that's a level that actually the Fed would consider sustainable when they, they look at it. They think 2% inflation, 1.5% productivity. That gets you to a 3.5% sustainable wage growth. We're actually trending at, in that direction fairly fast. So, you know, the Fed is going to have to be patient on this one, and they, they haven't had the luxury of time on their side. Um, but we do think that there is a fair bit of disinflation in the pipeline. Um, the recession is ultimately what's going to get inflation back down to their target. Um, but we do see that there is, there's quite a lot already there um, in the wings. Hey, Cassie, this was great. Cassie Burrow there of J.P. Morgan Asset Management with Love some it. artwork from Bob Michael behind her. Did you notice that? Yeah, but, you know, we talk to these people all the time. It's really hard to keep score, but I love that there's a broad changes. Did you not notice that? I noticed the artwork. Was yeah. that his? Yes, Bob Michael's, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he takes it into to J.P. Morgan. I love the... Um, I'm so confused. I Carry love on. how they've changed. I mean, it's very cool. These are some real seismic shifts from these major banks on the, the view of the outcome. Can we just share? We've had a Chairman Powell sighting. We, we had two, two things going on here. Surveillance correction here. I thought Nickelback was playing. I have been corrected. You confused it's Nickelback and with, Chairman Powell. With Jerome and the dot plots. Okay. They're going to be coming up here playing. Early. Actually, Chairman Powell walking by here near the 50-yard line. And I, I said, come on up and talk to us. And I, I'm guessing said, you didn't fancy it. <laughs> The uh, charm that you hire ahead. Well, what's the genre? Looking, yeah. Country? Oh, no, it's blues. Blues. Yeah. Come on, they're grim. <laughs> Can I just say? It's blues. There's only one thing <laughs> Jay, and, the Jay and the Dot Plot actually sounds like a good band. That sounds I fantastic. Like I would listen to Jay and the That's Dot right. Plot. The John buddy Lipsky. guy like no <laughs> John Lipsky, the former first deputy managing director at the IMF, is going to be joining us shortly. Looking forward to that. From IMF Global HQ, this is Bloomberg. Tom Keen, I can't even. Jerome in the dot plots. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. Fed officials feel they need to do a little more to tame inflation and are leaning toward another interest rate hike next month. That's according to minutes from their March meeting. This despite forecasts from Fed staff advisors that there will be a mild recession later this year. Another missile launch from North Korea. A suspected intercontinental ballistic missile was fired toward waters off Japan's northern island of Hokkaido. Now that prompted a brief warning for residents to take shelter. South Korea says it's possible that North Korea may have tested a new type of solid fuel missile. There's a report on the alleged leaker of those U.S. intelligence secrets. According to The Washington Post, it's a young gun enthusiast who worked on a military base and shared the classified documents with a group on Discord, an online platform used by gamers. He was known as OG and told the group he spent some time inside a secure facility. Discord says it's cooperating with authorities. 
Some fellow Democrats want Senator Dianne Feinstein to resign. The 89-year-old has been absent for about two months with a case of shingles. Representative Ro Khanna tweeted that it's obvious she can no longer fulfill her duties. Another Democratic congressman, Dean Phillips, said it was a dereliction of duty for Feinstein to stay on. And Feinstein says she's asked to be temporarily replaced on the Judiciary Committee. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. What we shouldn't be doing is saying we've got such a problem with financial stability that we have to, in a sense, aim off a decision on monetary policy which is taken with, obviously, with our inflation target in you know, primary view because of conditions in financial stability. Andrew Bailey there, the Bank of England governor here at the IMF Global Headquarters, Tom, over the last couple of days. I have to say, TK, that's the view of the Bank of England, and we should be very specific about that. That's the view of the Bank of England, a view shared by the ECB. It's a different kind of shock here in the United States oh, of America. Oh, hugely different. Oh, a yeah. completely huge, different shock, completely different. which is why the Fed has already acknowledged to some extent, to some degree, the shock we've seen yeah. over the last month will be a substitute for rate hikes. We just know how, we don't know how much of a substitute it will be. Wrapping into their original politics is the fact their core inflation is not our core inflation and the vector's nowhere like ours right now. We're doing better here in terms of getting rid of this difficult. Agreed. Inflation. It's a different story. Different story. Right now, we're going to do this for these IMF and World Bank spring meetings, bring in someone qualified with historical perspective. The academics are Wesleyan and his Stanford, and of course, his work now at Johns Hopkins. John Lipsky joins us, former first deputy managing director at the IMF with all sorts of heritage, I would say. I got to ask the first question, given the times, will you return to the IMF, the World Bank, or other August institutions? Well, I always enjoy visiting, but I think they've, <laughs> <laughs> they've got plenty of very capable folks here. What are the state of these institutions now in handling this crisis somewhat different, so different from what you lived in 07, 08? Oh, yes, absolutely. For one, they, we didn't have to operate in the sense of uh, a spirit of great power uh, competition. Instead, there was a sense of cooperation. The G20 was formed instantly. The G20 leaders process was created in the wake of the, of the global financial crisis. And uh, if you remember the April 2009 G20 summit, the exactly. second summit, yep. added a yep. trillion dollars of resources to the IMF. So there was real, there was real agreement on mm -hmm. dramatic cooperative action. That still has to be forged. They've in both here at the IMF, at the World Bank, and more broadly. Well, let's at, cut to the, the G20 chase. itself. One of your most historic speeches on the Pacific Rim in a burgeoning Vietnam in Hanoi, as you spoke, of course, to the large China adjacent to Vietnam, how things have changed from when you were on the watch. What is your interpretation of what Washington has to do, what Beijing has to do to get everybody on a more constructive page? Well, one of the implications of the world, uh, the changing situation, you heard just a few minutes ago from uh, David Malpass, the outgoing president of the World Bank, that this we have seen coming this crisis, debt crisis, especially of emerging and developing countries, especially affecting the poorest. There needs to be a, a new cooperation forged to deal with that successfully because the pre-existing Paris Club arrangement simply doesn't work. This, uh, what you heard about was this debt roundtable that met for the first time yesterday is an attempt to create a new forum for cooperation, not just China, but also the private sector has felt left out of the negotiations around the process, mm. and they're being brought in for the first time. So there's a lot to do, but there's hope that a, this new format will produce some progress. Although, how much is the larger sort of Belt and Road Initiative or using uh, lending to the developing world as basically a foreign policy uh, effort and trying to shore up support, how much is that 
shaking the foundation of the IMF in this sort of joint collegial effort to try to support certain nations for the goodness of the world? Well, the balance has changed a lot, but of course, there's been a lot of bilateral lending that often in the past that ha all, always has some kind of a policy focus to it. It's not just uh, uh, for the goodness of the, of the world that these loans are made. So the, the, what's happened here, of course, is that the size of China's involvement has become very large. But again, I emphasize, if there's going to be a solution, and now the crisis is coming upon us, a solution is needed. Something has to happen. Everyone's going to have to give and compromise, and the private sector has to be involved in a more direct way than has been in the past. I want to shift gears a little bit. The IMF came out and said that they see rates going back to where they were pre-pandemic, and eventually we will get inflation back to where it used to be. A lot of people push back, including BlackRock, coming out and saying, uh, Larry Fink saying, uh, potentially inflation at 4 percent for a very long time. Uh, where do you stand on this as a former banker as well as yes. uh, one of the leaders of the IMF? Dare I say it, uh, one of the little secrets of economics is economists have only a weak grap uh, grasp of the process of price formation. And as we've seen over the past decade is that central banks' ability to finally control inflation is much less direct than might have been thought or hoped. So. Do we, did, we, did we see coming the big surge in inflation? Most people did not. Can we feel confident we know what is going to happen in the, with inflation in the next, few, uh, the next year or two years? I think we need to watch carefully, and I suspect, I hope that, uh, well, count me an inflation optimist. Uh, I think it's going to prove less sticky than, than many do. Well, some people talk about talking about the monetary policy not having as much of an impact, the structural change. Larry Fink saying he sees the work from home dynamic as actually changing the inflation debate, that the work from home doesn't work and that productivity is dropping off. And that's the reason why inflation is going to stay at 4 percent. Do you agree? I say we're going to, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. All I can say is uh, I find working from home pretty good. Hey, you're and, not alone. And among, and among other things, especially dealing with international, uh, international uh, uh, discussions, it's so easy to connect internationally in a way or at a distance than what could have been done before. I don't think that that's uh, bad for productivity. John, they, in that piece earlier this week, if I can jump in because we're up sure. against the clock, yeah. there was a line in there, and I think the IMF acknowledging how difficult it is to forecast this stuff, it said our projections are only good as the projections that underpin them. Yes. And Two or three of the issues that stand out, and I'll pick out two of them. One is this transition to new sources of energy, and the other is deglobalization. And there are many people watching this program right now, listening to, who believe there is a secular component to this inflation story. Do you have any appreciation for that kind of thing, which is what I think Elisa is trying to, trying to dig into? Well, look, the last 25 years in the United States, inflation has generally been, for, with only two years' exception, at or below the Fed's target. The notion that this is inherently an inflationary economy is not obvious to me. And right now, we have people who have bet their personal finances on the maintenance of low inflation. So I think there's going to be a lot of support right. for policies that will keep inflation low. Because if we don't, if we fail at that, if interest rates stay, stay high, we have not just a fiscal problem, we have a personal finance problem. I want to ask you, as former vice chairman of J.P. Morgan, if Diamond's on target to do five days of work week here and lose work from home, but forget about that. This is too important. Do we lose a 2 percent line? John Taylor of Stanford is adamant there's efficacy to keeping those rules-based structures lower and lower. Do we have to reset 2 percent to a higher level? Uh, I don't think so. It's not obvious to me what would be gained at this moment by announcing that we're going to change our definition of where, where, where fever lies and we're going to decide that actually you can have a higher than 98.6 percent fever uh, temperature and it's going to be just See fine. Stanford <laughs> economics just like powers that. through there. <laughs> Those guys on the East Coast. Uh -uh. <laughs> hey, John, thanks no. for this. Just wonderful. John Lipson there. Great. It's always great to be here. With a different view, Tom, on things, we're going to catch up with Mohammed Alarian tomorrow, who I know has a, a, a different view on this situation. Let's put it well, that way. Well, within the publishing area, and of course, everyone's publishing here, folks, as we go into these meetings. Richard Clareda, Dean of Columbia Economics, as a former vice chairman, recent, even suggested not that there would be a policy, as Dr. Lipsky talks about, to move away from 2%. 
but maybe the end result would we, we would be higher than a 2% set. There is this idea, and some people, the cynical ones amongst us, believe that this is something... Oh, look at Let's all look at Lisa. <laughs> I, I might be Very speaking odd. for myself as well here, Lisa. <laughs> There are some people out there who believe that the, the Fed may well want to go in this direction, but now is not the time. Now is not the time to make that shift. There is a tension right now between being aggressive to bring inflation down in a tangible way sooner and having the patience to wait, right. knowing that if inflation ends up at 3%, it's not the end of the world. OK, so we can live with that because a temperature at 99 right. isn't that really a temperature if you're, you know, otherwise going to... I got an email. Who's playing drums for Jerome and the Dot Plots? Who is that? Goolsby. Very cool. He looks like Mick Fleetwood. Does Goldsby play the drums? Yeah, he's phenomenal. He's at Milton nice. Academy. He was like scary good years ago. I don't believe you. He's like a Mick Fleetwood thing. He's sitting low on the chair, it's hitting the cymbals up. Clarida. He's the singer. He, you know, like, Rich is a singer. Rich he is going to be drums. the singer and singer. the guitarist. So then Tom's that's a guitarist yet. too. Exactly. Yeah. So you want to sit, do Goolsby, backup? No, no, I'm not going to sit in. No, but Goolsby plays drums like a Democrat. That's all there is to it. What does that mean? <laughs> What does that mean? Lipsky got it. <laughs> Mike He's Wilson, like that be offset now. Morgan Stanley <laughs> joining us next from Washington. This is Bloomberg.